Today, we take you to Taiwan's indigenous roots and indigenous people. Tell us about the challenges of preserving their unique identities and culture. I'll tell you how Taiwan plans to shorten its quarantine period. We're also going to tell you who the most popular YouTubers in Taiwan are and what's made them famous. And in Hashtag Taiwan, Leslie gives you the lowdown on Taiwan's Lantern Festival. This is Taiwan Insider. Welcome to the show. Today we take a look at Taiwan's indigenous roots. Taiwan has an official indigenous population of nearly 600,000, or about 2.5% of the population. Let's take a look at how they're striving to keep their culture alive. In 1544, Portuguese sailors passed by Taiwan and called it Ilha Formosa, the beautiful island. Long before the Europeans, Japanese, or Chinese came to the island, the indigenous people have called Taiwan their home. Taiwan's government officially recognizes 16 indigenous groups, but there are many more that self-identify as separate and unique peoples. A hundred years ago, most of Taiwan's indigenous groups lived in the central mountains, on the east coast, and in the south. However, nowadays nearly half of the indigenous population lives in the urban areas of the country. Over the centuries, indigenous communities in rural areas have dwindled as many young people leave to pursue opportunities in the big cities. But in recent years, there's been a movement for people to reconnect with their indigenous roots and return to the places where their families are from. This has created an intriguing fusion of urban Taiwanese culture and rural indigenous traditions. Chen Zhiyi, a man of mixed indigenous heritage, returned to his village with his wife and children after his father's death. When he went through his father's belongings, he found traditional fishing tools, photos, and woven crafts that all illustrated his people's history. These precious pieces are now part of the Olang Museum, which features DIY classes for visitors to try making some tools themselves. Though in recent years, Taiwan has seen a growing public interest in indigenous culture, many indigenous groups say they feel overlooked and undervalued by the Taiwan government and general public. Some say when new visitors venture into their communities, they just take a few photos and leave without taking time to get a deeper understanding and appreciation for their culture. So, how can people learn more about indigenous people and their culture? One way people can make a deeper connection is by learning from indigenous people firsthand. Today, indigenous communities in Taiwan host activities and classes related to camping, cooking, music, tool making, and hunting, led by indigenous instructors. Through them, rural communities are giving non-indigenous Taiwanese a closer look at traditional indigenous culture. One of these indigenous guides is a man named Liu Jianchang, who leads classes and explorations on his people's land. Some research suggests that Austronesian people like Liu have been living in Taiwan for over 6,000 years, so the land is closely connected with the indigenous group's development and history. Here we have Niu Shan or Cow Mountain. Liu says he's been coming up the mountain with his family ever since he was a little boy. In that time, the herd has expanded from less than 20 cattle to almost 100. Another guide, Chen Jianlong, tells visitors that he does not bring groups to Niu Shan frequently because it could disturb the cattle in their natural environment. Chen says it's important for people to live in harmony with the animals around them. Hosting classes and activities is also a way for indigenous people to provide a stable income and home for their families. Since the 1600s, many different countries have colonized Taiwan and oppressed its indigenous people. Today, most of Taiwan's indigenous people remain below the poverty line. Their household incomes are 40% lower than the national average. On top of that, these indigenous groups must also reckon with powerful and dangerous natural forces. Taiwan's east coast is home to many indigenous peoples and is usually hit the hardest by natural disasters. These include typhoons, landslides, and earthquakes that further threaten the stability of these villages. These indigenous instructors have made a long-term commitment to keep their people's vibrant history and culture alive in their communities and beyond. They say they want the people of Taiwan to know that not all great innovators live in big cities, tech parks, and laboratories. Learning from Taiwan's indigenous people makes it all very clear that these groups that have thrived throughout thousands of years continue to create new things of beauty and wonder in the world today. 
It's great to see Indigenous people preserving their cultural legacy. The Education Ministry is also helping out this month. In the lead-up to International Mother Language Day, it has a campaign to encourage interest in Indigenous and other minority languages. Why should I study my mother tongue? Three schoolgirls ask their teacher. It's a pertinent question, and with International Mother Language Day coming up on February 21st, it's more relevant than ever. People in Taiwan speak a range of languages, including Mandarin, Taiwanese Hokkien and Hakka, along with Austronesian languages like Amis and Paiwan. But Mandarin's dominance is growing, with fewer and fewer young people able to speak their parents' other native tongues. That's why Taiwan's Education Ministry is using International Mother Language Day to promote Taiwan's minority languages. TV host Remy Gilles wowed attendees at the campaign's launch on February 11th by speaking Hakka, Taiwanese Hokkien, Amis and Bunun, as well as using Taiwan Sign Language. Education Minister Pan Wenzhong was also suitably impressed. Pan says if Taiwanese don't start speaking their mother tongues now, it'll soon be too late. Gilles, meanwhile, says the campaign is about instilling a sense of respect for minority languages and their heritage. As part of the campaign, 10 libraries and community arts centers will host more than 50 activities this month, ranging from board games to theatrical performances. With Gilles at the head, the government hopes it can kickstart people's interest in all of Taiwan's lingos. Next up, Stash tells us about something we who love to travel have been hoping for, a shorter quarantine. Traveling to Taiwan in the next few months? Well, good news for you. People arriving in Taiwan will soon be able to quarantine for 10 days rather than a full two weeks. Health Minister Chen Shui-chung says he hopes to be able to put the new rules into effect by mid-March. So the plan is this. Business travelers will be allowed into the country. Everyone will do 10 days quarantine either at a quarantine hotel or at home. But you'll only be allowed to do it at home if it's just you in the house or the apartment, meaning no friends, roommates or family members in the next room over. There'll be regular testing too. Everyone will take one PCR test when they arrive and then another at the end of the 10 days. They'll also have to take four rapid antigen tests, three during quarantine on days three, five and seven, and then one a week later at the end of the self-health management period. During that period, people aren't allowed to take part in social gatherings. So what's the reasoning behind the shift to a 10-day quarantine for arrivals? Well, Chen says there are a number of factors. He says one factor is that Taiwan's local case numbers are stable and controllable following the Lunar New Year. Another is that health authorities say Omicron has a shorter incubation period. They say 99% of people who get the virus test positive within the first 10 days. Also, Omicron is making fewer people seriously ill than other variants, and less than 1% of arriving passengers are testing positive in quarantine. So far, so good. But Chen says a few things need to happen before Taiwan cuts the quarantine period. First, authorities need to finish all the necessary preparations. That includes things like making sure Taiwan's healthcare system is ready and well supplied to deal with new patients. Second, health authorities have to keep Taiwan's local outbreak under control. And finally, Chen says Taiwan has to raise its vaccination rate, particularly for older people. The main target is to raise Taiwan's third dose vaccination rate to 50%. Right now, it's just over 30%, and at the current rate of vaccination, Taiwan should hit 50% pretty much bang on in the middle of next month. So there you have it. There's still some work to do, but Taiwan's border rules look set to get that little bit looser. Next on Hashtag Taiwan, Leslie tells us all about Taiwan's Lantern Festival. This past Tuesday was the Lantern Festival. Now, the Lantern Festival signals the end of the Lunar New Year celebration. In last week's episode of Taiwan Insider, we told you about how the Taiwan Tourism Bureau is putting on a month-long event for the Lantern Festival in Kaohsiung City. Now, as you might expect, the event features lanterns, but this year, organizers upped the ante and put on drone shows. 1,500 unmanned drones flew into the air and moved in synchrony to create images in the sky. 
The drones depicted lions, tigers, a whale, Taiwan, planet Earth, an airplane supply drop, and even Taiwanese badminton champion Tai Ying playing badminton. The show gets really specific. Even President Tsai Ing-wen tweeted about the drone shows. She pointed out that the drones paid tribute to countries that stood by Taiwan, like Lithuania, Slovakia, Poland, and Japan, by displaying their flags in the sky. Now that's just one highlight of the Lantern Festival. Let's move on to another highlight, which is this tiger tail accessory. Simply speaking, it's a tube-shaped balloon with tiger print on it. You blow it up, you put an LED light in it, you tie it around your waist, and it looks like you have a little tiger tail. Why a tiger? Well, because this year is the year of the tiger. This Lantern Festival souvenir has sold out completely. And when Kaohsiung City Government launched a limited online sale for the tails, well, they sold out in 30 minutes. Originally, these tube-shaped balloon tiger tail accessories sell for 299 new Taiwan dollars, which is about 11 US dollars. But people online are reselling them for as much as 750 new Taiwan dollars, which is around three times what they go for retail. While Kaohsiung city government is negotiating with manufacturers about releasing more of these tiger tails, a page on Facebook has published a guide on how to make your own. Someone's got to do something about this accessory shortage quick. Otherwise soon, these little tails are going to cost about as much as, well, an actual tiger. Every day, over 720,000 hours of videos get uploaded to YouTube. While some people may use this site to share fun cat videos, others have launched incredible careers. Let's take a look at the hottest YouTubers in Taiwan and how their fame has made them millions. Comedian Andy Tai's career took him from acting to YouTube and then back to the stage. You can see him at concerts with his YouTube group Muyao 4 Super Playing. They even host major events like New Year's Eve parties and have become one of the most popular YouTube channels in Taiwan. However, the group's 2 million subscribers and over 400,000 NT dollars in monthly income from YouTube ad revenue is not enough to get them into the top 10 list of Taiwan's top earning YouTube channels. Another recognizable personality, Holger Chen, follows closely behind Tai's entourage at the 15th spot with just below 400,000 NT dollars of monthly income. So who are Taiwan's most successful YouTubers? Well, the answer left many surprised. Coming in at number one is a Korean artist who is married to a Taiwanese woman. He runs the channel J. Lee Painting, through which he showcases his amazing abilities to paint using everyday objects. He is closing in on 5 million subscribers and raking in just under 4.7 million NT dollars, that's 168,000 US dollars every month. In second place is the computer graphics fueled parody channel Yes Ranger, which boasts over 3 million subscribers and a monthly income of 1.8 million NT dollars or 64,000 US dollars. Closing off the top three is Terry Films, a food channel showcasing traditional Taiwanese snacks and food. With 1.5 million subscribers, the channel nets just under 1.3 million NT dollars a month. It seems there is no shortage of talent among Taiwan's YouTubers, representing a wide range of genres. With top earners bringing home millions, it's no wonder more and more people in Taiwan dream of becoming internet celebrities. To all our YouTube fans out there, as you can see, your support really makes a difference to the channels you subscribe to. Now, before I go and join my co-hosts, let's take a look at the other stories that are on our radar this week. The South American country Paraguay has granted Taiwan's Medigen COVID-19 vaccine emergency use authorization. The vaccine underwent a phase 3 clinical trial where researchers measured the quantity of neutralizing antibodies generated by the vaccine. Then they compared that number to the antibodies produced by the AstraZeneca vaccine using a technique called immunobridging. Medigen says their protein subunit vaccine generated 3.7 times more neutralizing antibodies than AstraZeneca and that there were no serious adverse effects. Taiwan approved the vaccine for emergency use last June. Paraguay is the second country to allow its use, though some other countries do allow travelers who have received the Medigen vaccine into their borders. The vaccine is currently undergoing clinical trials in other countries and also being tested under the WHO's Phase 3 Solidarity Trial Vaccines program. The traditional Yanshui Beehive Fireworks Festival took place in Tainan's Yanshui District this past Monday. The festivities were downsized due to COVID-19. Only 1,000 people were allowed to take part in the festival's main event and all of them were required to have gotten two doses of a COVID vaccine. During the festival, revelers carry around deity statues on palanquins amid the smoke and din from hundreds of thousands of fireworks. Don't worry though, everyone wore protective clothing and helmets to avoid injury. The festival has its roots in a cholera outbreak in the late 19th century. 
The fireworks are said to ward off malicious spirits associated with the disease. The Taiwan International Documentary Festival has released its shortlist for this year's competition. Entries are divided into three categories, Asian Vision, International Competition, and the Taiwan Competition. Around 15 films in each category were selected from over 200 submissions from all over the world. Taiwanese entries that made the cut include The Catch by filmmaker Xu Zhejia and The Lucky Woman by Zheng Wenzhen. The festival will kick off in Taipei on May 6 with director Huang Xingyao's A Silent Gaze, which is shortlisted for both the Asian Vision and the Taiwan categories. Events will draw to a close on May 15. Well, we are back in the studio, and I thought the drone show was pretty amazing. What about you guys? I actually didn't manage to watch it, but oh. I did see a very cool picture. Very cool. What would you guys do, that's my question for today, with 1,500 drones? <laughs> okay, well, if I was doing a light show with 1,500 drones, uh, I would do something with the constellations. That would be very cool. So, Ooh. obviously, I know the constellations are already up in the sky, but, you know, the names of the constellations and what the stars actually look like is such an abstract connection that I think if you could sort of use drones to make these 3D versions that's of the true. pictures, whether that's, you can right. actually see Orion or you can see Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Usher Minor as these big and small bears. That'd be really cool to what, see in the sky. What's your star sign? What, what are you? Uh, what I'm you a be? Pisces. Oh, yeah. the, there should be a Pisces up there. It'd be right? cool if, like, you know, there's fish like jumping around <laughs> in a circle or something. That would be really educational too, mm -hmm. right? For astronomy class or something. Yeah, <laughs> could be cool. Could be cool. Uh, I'm, I actually. Um, I ran with it a bit, and I went for a bit something a bit maybe a bit narcissistic. I went for drone throne. I would make myself a throne out of drones, <laughs> and I would be carried up into the air oh my gosh, that'd for be all fun. the people to see. Uh, so yeah, that would be very exciting. <laughs> I'm not sure about the kind of mechanics of it or whether the physics of that makes sense, but I'm hoping someone out there can figure it out for me. That sounds like fun. Like you can pay big bucks for things like yeah, that, I'm right? Yeah, sure. So I would do, you know that we're called the Butterfly Kingdom? Oh. So I would do a show of butterflies. We have one of the densest butterfly populations in the world, over 400 different types wow. of butterflies. So I would like have them all different colors and flying around. Oh, wow, Natalie's Wouldn't that be beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's better than having to, you know, track down all 400 kinds of butterflies, get them all in a box somehow and then release them. Get right? the drones to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be so beautiful. Anyways, thank you for joining us on Taiwan Insider. I am Natalie So. I'm Emma Banat. And I'm Stash Butler. And uh, do follow us on YouTube like you follow all the other YouTubers. Yeah, we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We're on all major media platforms. That's right. If you want to catch us on Twitter or on Facebook, our username is just Taiwan Insider, one word. But uh, that's it from us for this week. So see you next time. Bye. Bye.